Oh. Okay, the second half of the show. Are we doing this first tonight? Here we go, covering the cow roots that have been requested by your friends and neighbors. Here, some of them on scholarships. There's a whole string tonight, I guess some of you might have noticed, having to do with the future and tomorrow, amongst other things. So I'll read, I may just wait and tie some of them together if possible. But here was the first one that happened to be requested that touches thereupon. And Kairut said, a certain man who was talking to himself one day said, if everything is just a poor reflection of something else, which I think he meant in quotation marks like he had heard that somewhere, that if everything is indeed just a poor reflection of something else, then what is human existence itself indicative of? And he thought and replied to himself, can I spell tomorrow? Oh, all right, I will say something. How about churches, synagogues, history books, philosophy books, the human brain are filled, have been, continue to be filled with great questions concerning what is the purpose of human life, or put this way, of what, of what is human existence indicative of? And they've talked about everything from pleasing the gods to paying off great cosmic debts to a blind evolution to being a piece of great Descartian machinery that's just running. People speculated, and all of it serves its purpose, as such as that if you want home delivery, you can leave out a note and you can get milk. You can get cheese, you can get donuts. You could, I guess, leave a request to be mugged first thing in the morning. They all mean something. But how about this? This man answered himself, what is... I didn't intend to throw you off that much. Rather than taking the straightforward approach that everyone else has attempted, which is never satisfied because it's never been complete, it wasn't supposed to, but the idea is... The questions of what is the purpose of human life? What does human life represent? All of the questions that you people can debate and do debate, argue, fight over, to say it is indicative, it is reflective of, and then they fill in normless been religious attempts to fill in the blanks of our existence is exemplary of the fact that the gods love us or the gods hate us. What if this is a more direct answer? You don't expect it. But that human existence is indicative of the fact that there's going to be a tomorrow. Because you could take other creatures on this planet, as has happened in your lifetime. By all reports, there are creatures that were alive since you've been alive who are now, as far as I can tell, absolutely extinct. They are gone. And yet life goes on. But would there be a tomorrow if man were not here? Is not the fact that man exists proof that there is tomorrow? Of course, ordinary people are going to say, you can't prove that. And as some of you so well taught me, to those kind of people, we go, that's a uh, metaphysical, for those of you who have never uh, studied any of the uh, Nigerian forms of Buddhism, that means... <laughs> means may your camels instruct you along such continuing <laughs> enlightening lines as have now obviously taken root in your brain. Just a joke. The ordinary mind would say that's no proof, but those of you who are getting good, you know by now that none of this has anything to do with proof and it has nothing to do with things being logical, nor does it have to do with being illogical. That's not the point either. But, in a way that cannot be fitted into, well, let's stick with prove, because that's what ordinary minds would want to say, it cannot certainly be proved whatsoever. Nor would anyone who understood it try to, as always, I will point out. But can any of you feel that the proof that there is a tomorrow is the fact that you're here? And I'm saying you as being indicative of, indicative of human life itself. That humans are here is proof that there'll be a tomorrow. Because there can be a tomorrow, and if you were a hippo, if you were a jackal, 
if you were that, I don't know what that creature was, that combination that some Kairuk mentioned between a bookcase and a, and a grain thrasher or a wheat thrasher. Because <laughs> first time I heard it, I thought he said a combination bookcase and brown thrasher, which was bad enough, but then it turned out somebody, I asked him that night was red, and I punched the guy next to me, and he said, nah, it was bookcase and wheat thrasher. So, but anyway, you can imagine, can you not, without any doubt, as much as we all love, the river pigs, pachyderms, our flying friends, that you can imagine any creature on this planet, not excluding attorneys, being gone, and life go on, but not humans. There is no tomorrow that humans, conversely, with all. Human existence is proof there is a tomorrow. Except, of course, I'll admit again, you can't prove it. And, of course, ordinary mind does not even want to hear that. Not only can it be proven, if it could be proven, ordinary minds, especially those given to any poetry, wouldn't like it anyway. They'd refuse to believe it. Because what are you going to write about? If you're not going to say, hey, we could be right at the threshold of self-destruction. Where's my pen? Where is my legal pad? And where is the address of that magazine that only charges you $5 to print your poem? <laughs> Or what would all those people that dress in those funny clothes and go in those places on Saturdays and Sundays and Tuesdays, what would they do for a living? They would be on the welfare rolls too, and the rest of us would have to be paying more taxes. So you're right, ordinary people. There was a car route tonight having to do with that one of them, if I'm not getting ahead of myself, which I am, that says those men without sight predict disaster. That's not a cheap shot at people. That is the nature of things moving from that everyone is dancing, whether anybody requested this or not, everyone is dancing, or it's the benefit of dancing with a two-legged woman, which is not a sexist, I just thought it sounded better. Kairuk dead, then you're saying a two-legged dancer to get your attention. Because as long as you're dancing with polarized reality, at least half of the time, and as always, you people are being magnanimous by making me say half the time, charitable, but at least half the time, you feel as though you... Things are definitely... I know yesterday I was feeling good. Maybe it was that couple of glass of wine I had. I thought things were all right, but no. no. Not that I turn... Now I see not only the network news, I turn on PBS and they get serious. I turn on PBS and I, things don't smell good. They do not smell good in the erstwhile state of Yugoslavia. They still do not smell good around the eastern shores of the Mediterranean. They do not smell good and the erstwhile Union of Socialist, Socialist Republics. The economy throughout this world is giving me the willies. No, things, things do not smell good. They do not. You can't help it if you're in the hands of the ordinary. If you've let that kind of sense of duty grab your ankles, as another one said, you are only a hair's breadth. Those of you who's ever had a rabbit breathe on you, it is quickly. <laughs> It's very quick, it's very quick, it's from there to you are dancing, you're in the warm embrace of death. Maybe not just then, but the, the kind of death, the slow death, the little death, and not the sex act, the little death of, boy, am I depressed. First, I get really ahead of myself, I like the one that not nobody asked me, well, go ahead. That the locality, the local that said, the local relative that says, I'd rather be dead than depressed. And the university said, stick around. <laughs> You get both, which is it. And those of you who don't see any connection a few nights ago, there's one about a bullet in mid-flight always contemplates returning home. And then there was about automatic, mechanical. Glee is a bullet in mid-flight. Don't you say? In other words, half the time, you can shoot off, you think, with well, it. I'm a bullet. I am a free spirit. I am flying through the air. The temperature is just right. It cooled down. Everything's just right. But in mid-flight, that is being alive, half the time, you're not happy. It's just the way it is. Don't blame me. Blame your own limbic system, damn it, or catch an express bus. That's the way it goes. You sleep half the time, you're awake half the time. Half the time you eat, half the time you're in the bathroom. As long as you're in mid-flight, as long as you're ordinary in mid-flight, even if right now you're happy, don't let this give you the blues. Well, if you're ordinary, of course, I can't help it. 
But if you're happy, you know this, all right? I'm happy. How long have I been happy? And you figure, well, I wasn't keeping real close track, but I figure I've been happy the last two hours. You know what that means? You've got two hours of gloom. Uh, we'll press on all time all together as we press on, believe it or not. Every time I use press on, by the way, this lead company keeps writing and saying that, that was, who the hell they are, that's some kind of copyrighted that we shouldn't say that. All right, I'll read this one. And Kyrut said, there is this fellow who writes to the show. And he says, quote, this new revolution thing that you say is always hanging around, has always been in existence. Well, it reminds me of a question. It brings up a question to me. Maybe one or two or three, but here it goes. And he asks the following. He says one, but it ends up being. <laughs> does the, this revolution exist to help other people, to help people? Or does it exist just to help itself? Or does it exist just to get other people to help it? That. No, never mind. I was about to be dramatic and do something like, boy, there is a question. I mean, there is a question to contend with. Well, I guess you could, or those of you that are from the country, I think there's still a few around. There's a question to contend with, or for $5, they'll let you wrestle a bear. Of course, if I really wanted to get dirty, I'd say, which one would do you the most good? Or you might, I think we're already past it, I don't know, but there was a building superintendent. There were three or four here connected with the fact about noises of elevators going from the basement to the upper stories of buildings, and one of them was a, some kind of, I hope it was in quotation marks or something, but some kind of building inspector that pointed out that if originally they had been able to contain the fumes in the basement so that they didn't seep on up to the upper floors, he turned to this you know, person and said, we would not be in the position we are here today. And the tenant will point out, well, that may be true. But if it had not been for, as he called it, the fumes coming up from the basement, we would not be, we would not have a here and we wouldn't have a today. If we get to it, if somebody requests it, you want me to go ahead and I'll light on some instant chi roots and put on, let civilization say a word, put on instant addendum. Page 24, the next request. And Kyra said, backup systems are important under two conditions where there is no original system and where tomorrow is expected. Uh, just so that you don't think I lied to you abjectly. See, I told you there were strings of them about tomorrow and et cetera. The whole thing about a backup system, what is that? Now, in the field of, what do they call it? Field of systems, I guess, systematics, all kinds of ordinary technological and white collar endeavors. Uh, they speak about backup systems in the world of computers. But consider backup systems to ordinary people long before personal computers, long before, believe it or not, electricity. What are backup systems? Well, let's see. How about religion? <laughs> Drugs, alcohol. Uh, I could drag it into the primary world and start talking about sex and et cetera, but it has to have been a wee bit secondarily eyes because just sex per se, if you were still to the point that you could just rut, if, if you could just screw with no secondary involvement, then that'd be one thing. That would be getting closer, but you can no longer do it, so that's not really fair. It's not a valid comparison. But think about what are the backup systems. In a sense, everything in the secondary world, all hobbies, all activities, are backup systems. Put it to you another way. It's a backup system on the basis that all sane, reasonable people have this 72-year continuing itch. And since they can't find exactly where to scratch, it's like these backup systems. You follow? It's like you've got poison ivy. And you know, for whatever reason, you got some kind of real low end, like some calamine lotion from Revco that was already discounted and cut out. You know, not some good stuff from Park Davis or somebody legitimate like the Catholic Church. You know, you got some kind of phony baloney calamine lotion from some little old tent down the street. They got a philosopher, so he says, banging a tambourine and telling you that, you know, poison ivy is your friend. 
back to something a little less metaphorically torted, perhaps. Everything that men believe in, in a sense, is a backup system. And Kyrou simply pointing out they are important under two conditions, and the two conditions you know, covered every damn thing in the world if you could hear it. One of them is if there is no original system, which there's not. Not to an ordinary man. Because all forms of religion, to go back to that, just to pick out the obvious one, are what? They're excuses for a lack of religion. Just to use their own terms. What's a philosophy? What's what's political? Allegiances. What are economic beliefs? What are any kind of passion that you have towards something in the external world? Some institution, some human movement, human beliefs, just anything. There's nothing wrong with it. But what is it? It is a backup system. And Kyrou simply points out that they are valid under two conditions, which covers everything, once you, once you put it together. That if there is no initial system, which there's not, because there's an initial system, why would you have another system? You know, so I was using religion, the obvious one, whether I played the words too much. I guess the way ordinary people might say it, if there was such a thing as an initial, original system of religion, then you would not have denominations. How about that? There would only be one religion. If there was one philosophy, to continue in the great traditional use, I'm sure the Greeks will hate me from their graves, if not Webster in Random House, of misusing the word philosophy, but everybody else does. You know, I think I'm better than everybody else. If there was an original, if there were a paradigmatic philosophy, that'd be it. There would be no plurals. For those of you that didn't like the man who refused to admit that the plural of a word was a synonym for it a few nights ago, I said, I figured it'd go over better if I brought it up tonight. It was a man who refused, after he understood how things were going on in a certain way, he refused to accept the fact that the plural of a word was also its synonym. Why do you need a plural of a word? You need a plural of a word because everything is a backup system. And if it's a backup system, there's more than one system. So you got to have plurals. You can't do away with plurals. If you do away with plurals, you know, God, shit, you might know what's going on. You wouldn't need a backup system. But he says backup systems are important under two conditions. All right, two conditions. Where there is no original system and where tomorrow is expected. Because the point is, if you've got backup systems, that means you're human. And if you're human, we've already established earlier tonight, if you're human, it's proof that there is a tomorrow. I guess I should let Kyra do it. I could do it another quick way and say, all right, as long as you realize just in your best condition without any self-effacement, if you just simply realize that you don't know everything, as long as we understand that humanity is at least in some degree in the dark, stupid, dense, a little ignorant, a little uninformed, as long as that's true, then hey, don't sweat it. Tomorrow will come, whether you're here or not. I know if you're not going to be here, some of you will take it personally. But if you want to take the long view, God knows why, but a lot of ordinary people, I hear them say that, of, let's take the long view. <laughs> then at least, that's the same kind of people that say they are very concerned of what kind of world they're going to leave their children, which means that you know, they begin to think, I'm going to have to leave this world. <laughs> and rather than say that, you say things like, well, at least I hope I leave it a better place than I found it. I what they hope. What they hope is, God, I wish I didn't have to go. But at any rate, what were we talking about? That if you could look at it in a certain way, as long as people are to some degree stupid, have no fear. Over the long view, whether you're here or not, humanity will be here. Because notice, at their level, hippos are not stupid. Elephants are not stupid. Elephants know everything, every possible thing having to do with the life of pachyderms. Everything pachydermian, elephants know. There is nothing you, I don't care what kind of education, that's true, I mean that. Even if you went to the University of Nebraska, there is nothing about elephanting that you can teach an elephant. There is no elephant that needs further instructions about how to elephant. <laughs> on that basis, if you can hear it, on that basis it is possible that elephants could by the farm as a race. 
elephants could go and tomorrow will still come. It's only those that still are trying to... It's only those that still, to some degree, if you could say it with some kind of humility, if you just admit, yeah, I don't know everything. I do not know. I'm not saying it's true, but humans believe it, that I do not know everything that takes to be a real human, or else I wouldn't still be itching. I wouldn't still be dissatisfied. So there is something, whether it be some kind of religious, spiritual, intellectual, God knows what. If there, there, there's something still lacking in what I know, I am not a perfect human. That is proof that tomorrow will still arrive. And your backup system, part of it is, in going, well, I don't know it all. Thank you, sir. I feel much better. That's what you should be saying. Because there is proof if you need it just for a second. Just any ordinary sane person says, well, I'll admit it. I don't know everything. At least you can count on tomorrow getting here. Well, I just did that one about the... <clears throat> building inspector that was connected with a string more if you were noticing this really has to do I'm not going to say much about it I don't think but it really has to do with again the nature of the secondary world and how it is built on the fourth S of speech and Kairut noted the safety stability the safety of city sanity is in having an index for your dictionary Might I be so bold as to, it just suddenly struck me, that might be looked at at one level as a kind of supreme backup system. Do we have anybody in here that, I don't want to think about it, I was going to say that doesn't get the point just of that, that's just the first line. I mean, is anybody going to go home now and maybe try and find or stop by a bookstore and look for an index for your dictionary and lay it next to your dictionary in case you ever want to use it? That is the safety. That is, it's not a joke. That is the very kind of intellectual backup system that keeps one from having to look in the dictionary in a sense. That keeps one, in a sense, from having to face the fact that, hey, I got no initial plan. That's why you keep looking for external sources, such as, again, religion, that, whoa, I got a bunch of backup plans here. I've got hopes. I got dreams. I pray that I, when I die, I don't actually die and all that kind of stuff, but I don't know. I don't have an original plan. That is the purpose of external apparent sources of authority because all you got to do is go find a holy book of some kind and sure enough, look in the index under ND, not die, and he'll say, no, you're not, going to, you're not really going to die. And you think, well, now I feel better. But you had a backup system and now you take this one as being the system. I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope. Why do they call that faith? I hope, I hope, I hope. But at any rate, in a non-religious, this covers it all. When I say non-religious, it swallows up that kind of backup system. But the safety, the stability, the predictability, the, pardon me, Mr. James, the pragmatic basis of City Santa is in having an index for your dictionary. And Kairut added, if you'd like this, I think I've already done it, but he says if you'd like the above in the area more having to do with behavior, if this was too strange, try it this way. The stability of ordinary men, not apparently talking behavior-wise rather than intellectual-wise, which is, the stability of ordinary man is such that when he's shot in the gut, he'll grab his stomach and say, I wouldn't have it any other way. Which those of you that can do your own addendum to the addendum, if the man is sane, which it says he is, a sane city man, he's shot. You know, the stomach doesn't have anything to do with it. You catch that, don't you? If he's shot here, he grabs himself there and says, I wouldn't have it any other way. Your addendum is sort of like this. As opposed to what? <laughs> well, yes, I don't mind being sad some and then eventually dying. And the universal says, well, good. You know? Sort of sarcastic. It says, well, good. That, that really, you know, that'll make my job a lot easier. You know, if you're going to agree to that. Uh, of course, do I have to say, do I have to point and say that I don't think this has really much of anything to somebody actually getting shot in the gut. How about what you think? So it was just a trick for those that didn't like the first line about thinking for then apparently having to do with behavior. How about what you think? What do people do? I mean, you think about something and then maybe you think, well, this doesn't make a lot of sense. But then you think, it's like you grab where you've been shot and you think, hey, it's my thought. <laughs> 
Or you, or you come out, you're staying around, you come out with your opinion about what may happen. And the former Eastern Bloc countries of Europe now trying to, Eastern Europe trying to work themselves into a free market economy and you come out with some theory and the people at the party, someone turns you and says, that's the kind of insight that made Kaiser Wilhelm resign and become a pastry. <laughs> and you take some, you take a certain degree of umbrage. Why? Because it, or somebody just says, hey, that's stupid. Now, you, of course, you wouldn't say it this way, but what you're doing is saying, well, it may be stupid, but it's my stupid. You're saying, I wouldn't have it any other way. Or somebody says, that is ignorant. You can't really believe that. Now you stand, and several other people, at least your peers, look at you when the, this person says, that's stupid. What are you going to say? What's any reasonable civilized person going to say? Well, they're not going to say, yeah, you're right. I'm stupid. <laughs> no, -uh. you have to grab yourself where you're shot and say, I wouldn't have it any other way. Because in essence, they're saying, if they're saying you're stupid, and you're saying, that may be, but it's my stupid. I'm the one doing it. I wouldn't have it any other way. And life thinks, well, boy, I, I, how much more cooperation could I ask from these little darlings? Back to you. Consider. Now, oh, here's one. I just, and Kairou said, a revolutionist's greatest weapon is self-pity. Well, we all need our little jokes every now and then. <laughs> Let's tell you the truth. Cairo slipped in the back. He told me what number of page he told me to watch it because he wanted to see what would happen. I noticed a lot of you didn't laugh when it was first read. Three minutes. All right, I'm going to read this one. Uh, this one, believe it or not, still, may I suggest, has something to do with the string that started out about the noises of elevators running from the basement to the above floors and that how many people take that kind of noise and that grinding of cables and the noises down in the shaft. Take it as not only being inescapable, and I'm not talking about just indigestion you have. I mean, that's bad and crude enough. You'll have to write Miss Etiquette about that. But the kind of crude noises you make that comes out of well, I'm not sure that Hungary is going to be able to accomplish anything if the former state of Czechoslovakia is actually going to split up. And somebody says, what kind of ugly, grinding noises is that coming from you? And you clutch yourself and say, you may call them ugly, grinding noises, but by God, they're my noises. <laughs> that whole string and then that building inspector that pointed out his opinion, that if they had been able to initially confine those fumes in the basement, to where they would not reach the upper floors, we would not be in the trouble we're in now. And the tenant pointed out, if you didn't follow it, what he pointed out was, yeah, we wouldn't be civilized. That's what those fumes were. Along those lines, may I suggest, I could be wrong, but may I suggest that this one fits in somewhere. Intellectually speaking, this one man found himself living next door to rats. Rats who were extremely nasty, noisy, crude, and heavily armed. He alternately cursed them, laughed at them, and was frightened by them. They, on the other hand, amongst themselves, whenever they'd see him, only had one comment. Just, they'd just look and go, minor inconvenience. <laughs> should we even consider, should I even ask you to ask yourself a rhetorical question, why do any of you chuckle or react at that? Well, imagine that if literally, right quick, if you actually were living somewhere in a nice neighborhood and suddenly you looked up one morning and there are rats. Cairo didn't say big rats, huge rats, but I guess you're going to have to use your own imagination. They're big enough for him to notice all this. <laughs> so we're assuming that they're not your just ordinary rats. Not only size-wise, but he points out they're extremely, unusually noisy, nasty. I mean, we're talking about nasty on top of a rat's nastiness and heavily armed. Now imagine they're sitting and living next to you and you were minding your own business. A nice civilized neighborhood. Would you not, alternatively, if you were just an average person, you know, curse them and maybe sometimes laugh at them? 
and then sometimes frightened by them. Are we gone? Uh oh. Bye. Well, they're right. Why would they have any opinion toward you? And if they did, how, how can you rectify? What sense can you make out of the fact that they're only comment toward you? And they just do it among themselves. They're not even speaking to you, but their only comment is you're just a minor inconvenience. Bye.